And just a, another announcement, you, you, know, you need to be on your best behavior. Usually we've been recording uh, the second service, uh, the sermon, uh, but we're going to do it at the first service. So, you know, uh, I wish, you know, I had laugh cues or, or something like that, <laughs> uh, you know, so that you knew when to respond, you know, with the oohs and ahs and, and whatever. I'm just joking. <laughs> I invite you to pray with me. And gracious and loving God, we offer our thanks for the beauty of this day. We're thankful for your word, which speaks to us, a word which captures our imagination, a word which, though old, is ever new. And so as we listen to the story of your servant Jacob, we pray that we may respond to that in fresh and new ways. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue uh, in the book of Genesis uh, with uh, the story of the life of Jacob. Uh, Jacob now is an older man. Uh, he has uh, made his, his mark in life. He's married twice uh, and uh, has 11 children, um, many, many animals, and he is about to return to his home. Uh, and, uh, you know, at home, you know, what, one of the things that he is anticipating is his brother Esau. Esau, you will recall, is the one whom you know, he cheated out of his birthright. Uh, and uh, Esau is still angry with Jacob. Listen for God's word. The same night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent, and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said to him, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And so he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob said to him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore to this day the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket, because he struck Jacob on the hip socket at the thigh muscle. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm also going to read a text that will be read at the second service. It's from the Gospel of Matthew. And it's probably one of the more troubling passages, uh, that, uh, one of the more troubling teachings that Christ offers. He said this, Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be the members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. Those who lose their life for my sake will find it the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I can still hear the voice of my college physical education instructor. Yeoman, you've got a lot of fights ahead of you. The occasion for those words was a wrestling match. In those days, colleges required physical education. And for two months, the unit that I studied was wrestling. Well, I'll never forget the day that the matches were announced at the beginning of class. 
I was to wrestle this guy who looked like Attila the Hun. <laughs> now, he was one of those guys that has to shave twice a day. <laughs> no one ever saw him smile. He was tough. I, by contrast, stood six foot four and weighed all of 165 pounds. Ichabod Crane comes to mind. <laughs> well, I begged and pleaded with the instructor. I said, please don't make me go out there and wrestle this guy. I'm going to get killed. I then resorted to the ultimate verbal weapon. I said, I came to college to become a minister. This isn't relevant. Well, with sadistic glee, the instructor replied, Yeoman, you don't think you're going to face combat in the ministry? You've got a lot of fights ahead of you. I went out to the match, wrestled for three minutes, and I hung on for dear life. I did not win, but I can also say my shoulders never touched the mat. It has been over 45 years since that day, but his words are still vivid in my mind because he was right. There have been many wrestling matches in my life, and they make my opponent that day seem quite benign. The matches I have faced have been the gut-wrenching decisions, the problematic issues, and larger-than-life opponents. I think these are the big wrestling matches in our lives. And it's from this perspective that we need to view the next chapter in the Jacob Chronicles. You see, when Jesus, you know, he uttered those troubling words, I've not come to bring peace but a sword, I, was, I think he was speaking about this type of an encounter. And so today I want to look at this sword that entered Jacob's life that night. First, by telling the story in an interpretive manner. And then I want to draw some conclusions for our day and age. Jacob, the patriarch of the Hebrew nation, experienced, I believe, the sword of which Jesus spoke. You know, Jacob could be our contemporary. I have tried to tell his story as one. You know, today he might be an executive, a salesperson, a banker, a broker, a teacher. He was bright, he was busy, industrious, although he wasn't at first, and he became a very successful person. He was, in short, a success. He had it made, and he made it. He had done well in life, and he wanted to return home. He was on his way home with his wives, with his 12 children, and with all of his possessions. He was probably eager to show the relatives back home that, well, he had done well. He was not a prodigal son returning home for food. Uh-uh. No, Jacob returned home as a worldly success. And as if to show off, he sends everything off ahead of time. So people will know before he makes his entrance, I've done it, folks. He could point to all the visible symbols of success in his life. His wives, his children, his herds, his servants, his possessions. This was the evidence that Jacob had made it. And in his mind, there was only one confrontation left. And that was Esau. Jacob was smart. He was sure of himself. You know, he had finessed Esau any number of times, and he could do it one more time. Perhaps he had the words already in his head. You know, what he would say when at last he stood in front of his brother Esau, the brother whom he cheated, I'm sure he worked it out. This is what I'll say. He knew he could handle even that confrontation. And perhaps this self-confidence was the reason why he sent everything on ahead. He wanted Esau to see all these things. He wanted Esau to know that he was not going to be messing with a lightweight. Uh-uh. 
He wanted to send his resume ahead, just as one does before the big job interview these days. And then, as if to savor the moment alone, the night before the big triumph, he lay down on the bank of the river to go to sleep. That was the moment of the attack. Now, the ancients believed that the rivers possessed demons. And these demons often attacked people at nighttime. Well, the book of Genesis says that a man wrestled Jacob that night. A man. I think for one moment, who was it? Could it be Esau? Sneak attack? We don't know. Esau certainly had every reason to attack his brother. And certainly Esau was a threat to Jacob. And Jacob recognized it. But it wasn't Esau. Could it be his uncle, Laban, the one with whom he had all those dealings? No. They had developed an uneasy peace. Neither represented a threat to Jacob. And so who was it? Who was it? It was God. Think about Jacob's life until this point. Everything in his life contributed to his success. In every way, Jacob has done well. He has matured, he even grew spiritually. But there was one confrontation left. Not Esau, uh uh-uh. He had to face the truth of himself. His wits and his intellect had held him in good stead, but now he faced the reality of who he was and what he was. Not in the presence of others. No. He would have to do this in the presence of God. This is the wrestling match. Indeed, this is the struggle. It's the same struggle that Jesus brings to our lives when he says, I've not come to bring peace now, but a sword. It is a disquieting struggle that requires us, you and me, to to deal with the reality of who we are and what we are to be. You know, Jacob has vanquished every earthly foe. He has wrestled with all the people in his life, and he has come out on top. But the stranger by the shore of the river did not allow him to win that night. Instead, at daybreak, and here's the amazing thing of the story, They wrestle all night, and at daybreak, what happens? The stranger touches his thigh, and it put it out of joint. Now Jacob suddenly realized that his opponent could have at any time won the match. And so Jacob does not let go. He does not let go until he is blessed by this mysterious stranger. And incidentally, you know, as I was you know, putting this together and rereading it again last night, it dawned on me that this is the second blessing that Jacob has sought. And maybe this is the harder one to get because he has to be honest in this one. He can no longer be deceptive. Does this struggle seem real to you? Because it is indeed a fearful one, one that can come upon us at any time. You know, it visits us at those times when we think we have the world by the tail. It's a struggle that forces us to be truthful with ourselves. It's a struggle that creates integrity. It calls us to confront our very soul, indeed, our very person. And it's then, it's then that we see ourselves unmasked before the throne of the Almighty. The struggle can occur at any time. Indeed, it literally mugs us. It grabs us, and it wrestles us to the ground. Read the lives of the great women and men of history. The saints, if you will. Martin Luther struggled with the meaning of grace and forgiveness. He literally struggled with it. If you go and see the castle, you'll see the ink blot on the wall where he threw the bottle of ink. But he struggled not in terms of doctrinal theology, which is his expertise, but rather in terms of his own life. 
He knew well the one with whom Jacob wrestled. The medieval visionary Hildegard of Bingen literally became physically ill as she struggled to communicate the visions that she had of God. The Spanish mystic, St. John of the Cross, spoke of the struggle as the dark night of the soul. I think this struggle has much to teach us. And if we wrestle this opponent, wrestle with this opponent with integrity, it will offer us a blessing. My years in Houston were filled with some interesting times. And at one point in my life, I had an opportunity to visit with someone who wrestled alligators. And, you know, besides, you know, questioning his sanity, I asked him, I said, you know, well, why, you know, what's the trick to it? I mean, how come you don't get, you know, bit? He said, well, here's the trick. He said, you only get bit if you let go. And so the first thing we can learn from this is don't let go. When you are in that wrestling match with the divine, don't let go. Hang on and struggle like Jacob did. Don't let go. It's a painful struggle. You know, Jacob went away limping. And you too might suffer scars, but there is a blessing in that struggle. Because it's then that we come face to face with the very being of God. It's then that God's still small voice becomes an unbearable shout in our lives. It's then that the sword that Jesus spoke of pierces our being. The sword that disturbs the easy peace with which we live because it's a false peace. It's not real. If that sword is real to you, if you're intimate with that struggle, hang on and don't let go. Know that the love of God, a God who loves us enough to grapple with us, indeed, a love that will not let us go, to quote the old hymn. The second thing we can learn is there's meaning and purpose to the wounds that often occur in this struggle. The story ends with Jacob limping off to see his brother Esau. He was wounded in that encounter with God. I'm coming to believe that many of the important soul-making events in our lives leaves wounds. There are tender places in our hearts and souls that even the strongest cannot bear to have them touched. It's my conviction that these wounds are the portals through which the grace of God enters our lives. The Jacob Chronicles tell us that there is a powerful, albeit ironic, bond between our blessings, our real blessings in life, and our pain. Third, I think it puts all of life's struggles in perspective. You know, there are many things with which we wrestle and fight. I know. You know. We struggle for success. We struggle and fight at the workplace. We struggle and fight for budgets for our department. We deal with opponents and we deal with rivals. We struggle with circumstances and coincidences. We struggle with loss. We struggle with illness. And these struggles are often consuming. But the biggest struggle that we have is the one that Jacob encountered that evening. Life's biggest struggle is, this, is the, this, the claim upon our soul. It is a struggle to be genuine in the presence of God. You know, a person can win all the battles in life as Jacob had done and still creep like a coward from this encounter. Yielman, you have more fights in the future. Truer words could not have been spoken. And some of my foes make my opponent that day seem like a teddy bear. You too have many matches ahead in your life. They contain the promise of a blessing. You know, Jacob wondered who his opponent was that evening. And the name Peniel indicates that he wrestled with God. 
If you're struggling with something painful, if you're struggling with a reality, something you can't identify, but seems real nonetheless, wonder not who your opponent is. Hang on. Hang on like it's an alligator. Because Christ's sword may have pierced your life. Hang on. Because his peace and rest will also become real. And in that struggle, there is indeed a blessing. This is the good news. Amen.